All right, welcome back to Firewall. I'm your host, Bradley Tusk. My guest today is Nicole Gelinas. If the name sounds familiar, it's because you either know her work already or because Hugo and I talk about you sometimes on the podcast. So uh, Nicole's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. She's a columnist for the New York Post. Uh, she's got a book coming out that we're going to talk about. Uh, but really, I would say one of the smartest people in thinking about the, the, the intersection of the policy of New York City, the economics of New York City, the, the culture of New York City, um, and the politics of it. And so I think that you capture a lot of this in your columns and writing better than anyone. So thank you for joining us. Good morning, Bradley. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is let, let's just kind of level set on like where, in your view, and your view and mine, I think are fairly similar here, New York City is. And, and obviously you wrote a piece uh, maybe about a month ago now or so for the New York Times uh, column that was very critical of Mayor Adams. Um, that got a lot of attention. And uh, so that sort of gives away your your view. But, you know, right now, how's the mayor doing? And more important, um, how's the city doing? And I think even your column this, this morning, to a certain extent, answer that question. Yeah, I think we're at a point of uneasy stagnation. And you may say stagnation is a boring cop-out word, but there's really no such thing as stagnation in New York City, because if we're not moving forward, we're going backwards, and yep. we're doing so in a very chaotic manner. So what does stagnation mean? The mayor's in his third year. He's up for re-election uh, just a little bit more than a year from now, next summer. And he can't point to significant irreversible progress on crime. So felony crimes overall are about 40% higher than they were when he took office. And to give him some credit, he's actually done well on murders and shootings. He's got murders and shootings significantly down. Uh, but on other felony crimes, no progress at all. On misdemeanor crimes, particularly petty larceny, you know, people can continue to see if the drugstore hasn't closed, all the stuff in the drugstore is still locked up. A lot of unease on the streets, including the reports over the last few weeks of uh, young women being randomly punched, including on the Lower East Side and mm -hmm. uh, West Village and Chelsea. So there's frustration that the mayor hasn't made more progress. Now, the problems of the city cannot entirely be laid on him, but on the other hand, he doesn't do a consistent job of laying out what is it that impedes him it, it, it from making progress in some areas and being consistent about does he need additional state legislative changes from Albany? Does he need more action from the DAs? You know, what what is going wrong that he can't succeed? He's never clear of whether he wants to declare victory and move on like he tries to do with subway crime or whether he wants to continue to act as if this is a crisis and he's trying to fix it. But whatever it is, People are very frustrated and uneasy, and you can see that in his low poll numbers. And, and if you, if he called you, I'm guessing he's not your biggest fan, but if he, if he called you and said, all right, Nicole, give me three things I can do to be a better mayor, what would they be? I think visible progress on the subways where he doesn't have to explain to people every day that things are getting better. People will know on their own if things are getting better or not. If he's right. if he's out there trying to make that argument that, you know, what you see on the subway is not reality, he's losing. Right, because so we how, all experience it every day. Right. I mean, even coming here this morning, you know, two grown men jumped over the turnstile at 50th Street, started acting disruptively in the station. Not the end of the world, you know, nothing violent or anything going on, but it makes a person uneasy to see, here's this low-level crime going on right in front of me. Why wasn't that stopped? And what else could potentially happen in here? So how would he make real progress on the subways? Uh, first of all, you know, because this kind of points up his attitude toward a lot of things. He looks for short-term headline results and doesn't focus on the long-term. So we know when subway crime goes beyond the point where people are uh, actively upset about it, you know, during the week after one of these fatal pushings, like we had the fatal pushing just two weeks ago uh, today, uh, he will put a surge of police officers onto the subway. So you'll see a visible presence of police on the platforms, sometimes on the trains, and that does work. Uh, but the problem is, once he's got the numbers down for six weeks or so, those police officers disappear. Uh, they melt away because they're, he's doing this based on overtime. And there's no uh, tracking of when the police make an arrest, 
that person just goes through the system. They don't get the mental health care that they need if they're severely mentally ill. There's no effective deterrent through the criminal justice system if they are not severely mentally ill, but just recidivist uh, people involved in crime. Uh, so those results disappear when the cops disappear, and then you start the cycle all over again where there's another outbreak of violence on the subways, and he does the surge in cops again. Right. Now, and, obviously... And, and would you say, like, so subway crime in many ways is one of the much most tangible things because we all use the subways and right. we all feel it, but... And it, it's random. This right. is almost all entirely random crime, whereas if you are a crime victim above ground, not that there's any excuse for it, but you're m much more likely to know the perpetrator of right. the crime. But there are all these markers generally that have made the city feel bad. The, the proliferation right. of illegal weed shops everywhere, people shooting up fentanyl on the street, scaffolding on every single block, shoplifting ep epidemic where you have someone say, you know, open a case for you, get a tube of toothpaste at CVS, and all of it collectively feels bad and... It's why I would argue he has the lowest approval rating of any mayor in New York City history. What doesn't he get about this? Even let's just say that he's a typical politician, doesn't care at all about anyone but himself. For his own good, attacking these problems consistently and aggressively would make the voters a lot happier. What's wrong with him? Why can't he do it? Right. So what he needs to do on subways is make a case to the city council, to the public, that he needs more funding to add police officers in the transit system. You know, in other words, go from the 2,700 permanent transit police officers up to 3,000 or 3,200, say for a five-year period, and lay out what those police are going to accomplish strategically and tactically, what he needs from the DAs and the state legislature for those new police to be able to accomplish these things, and make it very clear that this is a long-term strategy. This isn't just moving from crisis to crisis. But he doesn't do that because he thinks yeah. in terms of the daily crisis, the daily headline, and how do I change that headline to a different headline tomorrow? Well, he's and governing like he's still the bar president. And, and why does, you know, when, you make, when you're saying you make the case with taxpayers, you're saying give me more of your money, taxpayers, because it will ultimately be better for you. Bill de Blasio increased the city budget and the city bureaucracy, you know, by 10 to 20 percent with no measurable gains that I could find in any way. So why not just say, OK, we're going to reduce non-teaching staff at DOE by 50 percent. We are going to, you know, it, it, you don't even actually have to raise taxes. You can just simply just cut a lot of the fat. Um, why, is he afraid to make the unions mad because I'll hurt him in the election next year? Yeah, I mean, he went through a full round of union negotiations without asking for any concessions from the workforce. Uh, yeah, you don't. he doesn't have to raise taxes. I mean, back in 1990 when Dinkins made this case that he needed more police officers, he went to Albany and made the case he needed a tax surcharge. The budget has so much room for, as you said, uh, Mayor de Blasio added tens of thousands to administrative staff and to DOE. A lot of those positions can be cut, including through attrition. There's plenty of room to cut in the budget to add more room for transit police, so these are not overtime shifts. But he doesn't, he doesn't look at the budget as a document where I want to put my own priorities on the budget. He treats the budget as another place where it's just moving from crisis to crisis. You know, one day we're cutting billions of dollars in, uh, in emergency cuts out of the budget because of the migrant crisis. The next day we declare this is not a crisis anymore. We're going to reverse these cuts. So people don't believe what he says anymore about right. these things. And that's true. You know, you ask for three things. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of one and a half. I mean, the same thing with the migrant crisis. What is your long-term strategy and what are the tactics you're going to use to achieve that long-term strategy? We see very little of that. You know, what is what is the exit strategy from these hotel shelters? What does this look like in five years? He hasn't ventured any of those answers. And what what would happen if he just said, Immigrants have been coming to this country legally and illegally for hundreds of years. We have never before said it is our responsibility to house and feed and clothe every one of them. So, you know, I don't control the borders, but if people show up in this city, they should be like every immigrant in history and fend for yourself. And if we, if you can't fend for yourself in New York, go somewhere else in America or go back to your country, whatever it is, where you can, you know, wh why do we need to provide all of this? Because that's all the money that could be going to more subway cops or anything else. Yeah, it's very strange because he, he made this decision, or somebody did, early on 
to treat the migrant population and the traditional homeless population differently. So, you know, the, the overarching philosophy of New York before this crisis was we treat everyone the same. So if you show up at a homeless shelter, this is your first day in New York City, you, you clearly uh, are new to the country, they wouldn't ask your immigration status, they wouldn't ask any of that, you would just be put in the homeless shelter like everybody else. So they decided once Abbott from Texas started to bus people to New York City in the late spring of 2022, we're going to open up all these welcome centers just for migrants. So they created a parallel two-track uh, homeless shelter system giving the migrant population above and beyond what we traditionally give to the New York City homeless population. Very strange uh, uh, attitude to take to all of, all of this. If we had treated the migrants the same way that we treat the traditional homeless population, a lot of the migrants would have found their way outside of the shelter system. Because if you don't have to be in the homeless shelter system, you don't want to be in it. But instead, by creating these welcome centers, by setting up separate migrant hotels with all of these separate migrant services, we sent a message to the world, this is what you're supposed to do when you come to New York City. You're supposed to go to one of these hercs and become set up in a hotel and now become set up with debit card funding. So of course, there, it's perfectly rational to take advantage of the system if you are a migrant to the city or to the country. And much of this problem would How disappear. How did that not occur to him? Uh, you know, it's very strange. Uh, you know, first of all, there's a more cynical view would be they're just using the migrant population to create this whole infrastructure of no-bid contracts and billions of dollars now going to these no-bid contract bidders. Well, but, but some with, of it with is the, just, So the citizen, though, to quote yeah, circle I mean, would be, he then benefits in some way from the people wanting those contracts. Right. I mean, the hotel industry, particularly the budget range and low mid-range hotel industry was suffering to uh, put 6,000 hotel rooms into the migrant system essentially permanently. I mean, they're now going over a billion dollars on these uh, migrant hotel contracts. Yeah. was very good for the hotel industry uh, at the time. Who, but long who supported him in his Right. Life. So there's you know a few different ways of looking at it, but I think a lot of it is just not looking to, once we do this, what happens after that, and then what do we have to do in response to having done this? So you set right. up these welcome centers, and but there's no way to get out of it. You know, right. what do we do uh, a year from now? So when it's, it's governance in a way where he's kind of winning the battle and losing the war, which is he's thinking about, like you said, every headline or every interest group and every individual component of the reelection. But at the same time, because the, 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 the sum is greater than the parts, the city just macro feels bad and he feels ineffective, and as a result, he's wildly unpopular. Right. I think that's that's a good way of, of putting it. And just sort of simple management issues like data. Uh, I foiled months ago to every conceivable department that would have this data. You take the four Manhattan hotels, you know, the Watson, the mm -hmm. Stewart, the Roe, and the Roosevelt, by hotel room. What is the number of people in each hotel room? What is the number of adults versus children? What is the country of origin? And how long has that particular group of people been in each hotel room? Mm -hmm. Not looking for any names or anything like that. You know, right. There should be no privacy issues. But if, you're, if they are sticking to their, uh, their goal of asking people to turn over over 30 to 60 days, they should know this basic information. How long has this family been in there? And is this... A mother with three kids, or is it a 20-year-old man in each of these hotel rooms? You know, these are policy issues of how efficiently are we using these rooms, but they don't even seem to have this this basic data. Now, if you're if you are managing a private sector hotel and there's a problem in one of the rooms, you should be able to know. You know, room 802. Uh, a, a single woman rented that room, or there's, it's reported that four people are in that room. I mean, they should have that basic data at hand, and they don't appear to have that basic data at hand. So, you know, just one in 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 terms of how many people have actually applied for asylum. I mean, we don't even seem to know that type of information. And so, I would argue, and agree or disagree here. So, you mentioned he's governing like a borough president. I would say the, the equally big problem is he has only hired people who he either already knew as borough president or he like went to high school with. And 
running the city of New York is one of the most complicated jobs in the world, and you can't fill it with cronies and hacks and, and political favors. Right. Now, every mayor... So uh, we went over two things, uh, the issue of subway crime, yep. a long-term strategy and tax- tactics to achieve that strategy. On the migrants, part of it is just basic competence. And third, who who does he have running the government? All mayors have cronies that they have to reward or that they want to yep. reward. They have people that have been loyal to them for decades that they want to keep around to look mm-hmm. out for their own interest. That's not exactly great government, but that's fine. But you need people in addition to that. You need a very strong, competent first deputy mayor who just sort of runs the place where you're focused on other issues. And you need to appoint people in the commissioner positions who have experience in their field, who in whom you give autonomy for the most part, but hold accountable for their major decisions. So if you have a DOT commissioner, you know, give that person the autonomy to run the streets. And if you find after a year you are massively dissatisfied with the high level decisions that person is making, ask that person to resign and move on. But don't go meddling in these large scale decisions and undermine the authority of the commission, you know, saying we're going to do a bike lane here, going through the year-long process, and then having someone in the administration say, we're not going to do that. We've, we've heard complaints about that. Same thing with the police commissioner in the mayor and his uh, sort of loyal cronies undermining the disciplinary process of the former police commissioner. You can't have that kind of micromanaging and meddling. So whatever is the strategy that he wants to accomplish, find people who subscribe to that strategy and let them do what they need to do to accomplish it instead of having a a core cadre of cronies managing these departments and sort of uh, micromanaging from City Hall. Yeah, I mean, I would argue from from my time in the Bloomberg administration, the thing that if you made a list of the 100 best things Mike did as mayor, it, it, number one's not 311 or the High Line or the Tech Campus. It, it's simply that he just said, I'm going to hire the best people I can get, and I don't care what their politics are, I don't care what party they're in, I don't care about patronage, and then I'm going to let them do their jobs. I'm going to make them hire everyone else who at least isn't you know, in, in a policy-making job um, the same way. And so thousands and thousands of talented people who might not normally work in city government or not necessarily work in New York City government showed up and then were given the freedom and responsibility to the, go get stuff done and by and large they did and not every hire was perfect and not every policy was right but the vast majority of them worked out pretty well um and, and that's how you run a city like this and we seem to have the exact opposite it, it, is there hope for a turnaround or is this just his worldview and who he is and 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 we're stuck with it I mean, you always have to say that there's hope because otherwise we're just sitting here waiting another two years, you know, thinking about the various investigations into the mayor's uh, fundraising practices and so forth. So it's kind of depressing. I mean, what what would he do if he wanted to affect a turnaround? Sort of immediately do what we just talked about, bring in some outside people that he can learn to trust, uh, ease out some of the cronies or at least... You know, it's almost better to have no-show jobs in in this case. I mean, you can (laughs) continue to reward them without allowing them to have such a a big say over uh, day-to-day and longer-term government decisions. And really start to walk around and see for himself, if if he walks around Midtown once a week, is this the Midtown that I want to show to commuters and people coming back to work? You know, illegal vending all over the place. As you talked about, scaffolding still all over the place despite the supposed crackdown on scaffold. The marijuana stores that are everywhere, you know, they don't need new laws to crack down on the marijuana stores. They just not, they have yes. not put Right, the, so, so why, I just, again, if, if, if Mike were mayor, it seems to me pretty simple. He would have told the police commissioner, padlock every fucking one of them. Mm-hmm. And if, if the padlocks are broken and anyone's inside, they go to Rikers. What's so hard about this? It's not hard. And there's a lot of, you know, you have to, if you're running a business, you have to pay your employees Social Security contributions. You know, do audits on those types of things. If, you are, if you're selling products over $25, you have to give out an itemized receipt. There's a lot of, what, you know, workman's comp. Are they paying their workman's comp for the workers who have been shot? There are a lot of ways to shut down these stores, uh, but they're not... 
neither the state or the city. So is it is. is it a competence problem, a corruption problem? Because the notion that these, let's say there's three or 5,000 illegal weed shops, there's not three or 5,000 small struggling, small business owners who are just trying to feed their families. This is organized crime. Mm -hmm. So... Is it that they are paying people in government off? Is it that this is just the most incompetent government we've ever had? Like, I don't even, some stuff I, I know how to explain why it, it doesn't work. This one is almost unfathomable. I think a simple explanation is they're just overwhelmed and they don't understand where to direct the workflow in order to actually get stuff done. Uh, you know, who, naming one person accountable for this is your portfolio. We're going to give you all the tools you need to do this. If you call someone in one of my departments and they are they won't cooperate with you and they say we don't need to talk to you because you're, you know, you're you're not my boss, uh, that person will then face some accountability. You know, it is your job to make sure the marijuana stores are closed down and you're expected to do it in some time frame and if you can't you know you're you're going to be gone but there is no sense of that type of accountability across multiple areas i mean for example many of these high profile uh subway pushers shooters and other uh perpetrators of these uh high profile crimes they've been through both the criminal justice system and the serious mental health system if you can call it a system so bringing in both the police commissioner and the Department of Social Services commissioner and saying, which of you failed here? I mean, if this guy was arrested, he was released on no bail or low bail, you know, fine, that's on the DA. But why wasn't this person hospitalized? If they were hospitalized, why weren't they kept hospitalized? Because in many cases, it's not even the involuntary hospitalization issue. They want to remain hospitalized, and the city hospitals are still releasing them after 72 hours. So sort of, if there's only two places where something went wrong, which of the two places did it go wrong, and how can we make sure it doesn't happen again? Okay, so here's the really, if everything we've just spent the last 20 odd minutes talking about wasn't depressing. So he is, mm -hmm. is the lowest approval rating of any mayor in recorded history. He, for all the reasons we've just said, is wildly ineffective. Um, he is under federal corruption investigations, and this is the third time in his career now where he's been on the brink of criminal indictment. Um, and he's been accused of sexual assault, right, and being sued for that as well. And yet, if you were going to handicap the 2025 mayoral election, I think he'd be the favorite. You'd bet on him. Do, do you agree with that? And if so, what's wrong with our system that you could be have all these things and still get reelected? I won't make a prediction, uh, you know, partly because I don't want the prediction to become reality, uh, you know, even yeah. uh, not to be, uh, not to say someone or another should win, but in every election, it is healthy to have an array of candidates sure. for the voters to choose from. And actually, we, we had that in 2021. Mm -hmm. And people chose Adams because he ran and won on the criminal justice situation. People were very uneasy about subway crime, about random uh, both felony and misdemeanor crime. He was the only candidate who consistently focused on that issue. Uh, but he hasn't delivered for them. So we, t the uh, sort of miasma of New York politics tends to focus on a challenge from the left that it could be controller Brad Lander, could be another left-wing candidate. I don't think a challenge from the left will have very much credibility because yeah. there's nothing that the public has said in any polls and any... Uh, issues of how things are going, that they are looking for a left-wing Right. We, we, we want crime yeah. to get even worse. Right. So, and there's no there's no sense that the city has turned further left over the last four years since the two left-wing candidates clearly lost the election right. in 2021. The real credible candidate would be a moderate Democrat who yes. essentially says, the mayor's right about what he's trying to accomplish. He's just not accomplishing it, and I have the right. credentials to accomplish so, it. So, like, maybe someone from 21 who got the Times endorsement, and now it runs the state of New York. Yeah, uh, but that is difficult to make that type of competency argument in a low-attention, low-turnout election. Right. So, so, historically, in these situations where New Yorkers feel scared is when turnout tends to rise, and right. you've had people like it, even from the other— other party, Giuliani went in 93, or after 9-11, Bloomberg winning um, in 2001. Do you think the fact that people feel 
um, that their quality of life is declining. And this was a column that you wrote in the Post today. People are, with means are, are leaving the city, right? Tax tax projections are down. Um, will that get more people to then actually show up and vote in a Democratic primary next year? It's hard. Uh, you know, these are these are off cycle, middle of the summer primary elections. It is it is very hard to get people to pay attention and to understand what they're voting for, what the candidates uh, stand for versus you know, what they may say at one particular community meeting or another. Uh, hopefully it will happen. And another thing we can't forget about is the city council and the state legislature. I mean, these elections are even harder because yeah. most people don't know who their council person is. What your council person is saying on Twitter is very different than what they'll say at a community meeting of local residents. I mean, Tiffany Caban on Twitter is very different from Tiffany Caban that shows up to, to local meetings in the neighborhood. Uh, so people tend to like their own council person personally, don't hold them accountable for what's going on in the city. But would there be some way of having kind of a uniform labels attached to some of these candidates? You know, of the top three things that voters are worried about, which council candidates actually stand for fixing those three things? Uh, but with just individual atomized elections, uh, most of them are just decided on personality and who campaigns the hardest, which is fine, but it gets you to a place where you don't have a council aligned with what the voters say they want in terms of quality of life. Now, I think the mayor could be doing a much better job with the council that we have. There are some council people who could emerge as Peter Vallone type characters, get together a cross-racial coalition on some basic quality of life issues, but he prefers to use them as a foil because it deflects from his own accountability. I mean, the two veto overrides, there should have been a deal made on those. Uh, but And if there was no deal to be made, he shouldn't have let them override him because it gave them a big victory. Uh, he should have just signed the, the, the bill. So he's not approaching the council strategically either. Yeah, or anything else. So pivoting here, um, you have a book coming out in November on Election Day, actually, <laughs> uh, called Movement, New York's Long War to Take Back Its Streets from the Car. Um, let's start with just give me the premise of the book. Uh, the premise of the book is that over the so the power broker came out 50 years ago mm -hmm. uh, and i see the copy of the yep the power we, we, broker we, we stock it uh, proudly here yeah, yeah. It, uh, so it came out 50 years ago that book chronicled 50 years of the ascent of the car from roughly around world war 1 it was actually much earlier than world war 2 up until the mid 1960s New York's response to the growth of the automobile was to make more room for the automobile. You know, building highways, widening roads, narrowing the sidewalks, failing to fund mass transit. We thought, the car's here, we have to make more room for the car. We stopped doing that in the mid-1960s. You know, the protests against the highways uh, uh, started rebuilding the subway system in the late 1960s, uh, took you know, 15 years to get some actual funding for it, but the creation of the MTA mm -hmm. in 1968 was a good start. But we've now had more than 50 years of the post-automobile era. Yeah. Uh, and, and you could say, post-automobile era, well, I, I still see automobiles out there. Well, we don't, we don't build more space for them, and we've, in fact, been shrinking their space uh, going back 50 years and, and even a little longer. So... What has actually happened in those 50 years? So I talk about the creation of the MTA, mm -hmm. politics of building bike lanes, building bus lanes, uh, getting crime off the subways in, in the early 1990s, uh, leading up to the pandemic. Our differing, our changed approach to the car was what helped us be a competitive global city and helped us succeed on the cusp of the pandemic. Now, what, what, why? Uh, because this is a massive quality of life issue. I mean, this certainly rivals crime and uh, disorder as something that will drive people away from a city. You know, the pollution, the noise, the danger posed by unbridled motor traffic. Uh, this is something that Bloomberg understood, even something that before him Giuliani understood. I mean, the, the uh, peak of... Uh, uh, traffic deaths was the same year as the peak of murders, 1990. They went down steadily under Dinkins, Giuliani, Bloomberg, uh, de Blasio embraced Vision Zero. I mean, yep. this is, 
you know, the biggest worry you have about your kids in the city is they'll get hit by a car, or if you live in Staten Island, you live in Eastern Queens, your kid is going to drive his own car into a tree. So this is a big public safety and quality of life issue. And although congestion pricing, all that's a whole other conversation in the details, we're not going to recover from the pandemic in re-embracing the car. Right. So then what are, what have the best policies that we've done to kind of move away from the car and reduce traffic deaths? And what, you know, if you were, if I gave you a magic wand and said, okay, you can declare, you know, these three things, whatever it is, what would they be? I think the speed and the red light cameras, one thing Adams is asking Albany is more speed and red light cameras. Mm -hmm. I think he should get that, uh, although they could be more uh, vocal out there about asking for these things. Uh, More red light cameras, uh, including in, in core areas of Manhattan, ahead of congestion pricing, because congestion pricing will give these cars and trucks more room to speed. So you want to give them a reason not to speed. Right. That has worked very well. Most people don't get a second red light or speed camera ticket. They change their behavior. Uh, and just taking away the physical space from the vehicles. I mean, in some ways, the Paris approach of shrinking the space for the vehicles has worked just as well as the London approach of charging vehicles to enter the central city. Uh, we've done a reasonable job of that, but we could do much, much more in terms of, and and also the enforcement of the bus lanes, you know, the MTA has the authority from the legislature to do more of that. Uh, Actually taking the bus down Fifth Avenue now, you you fly down Fifth Avenue. It's much better than it was even five years from now. So better automated enforcement, Mm -hmm. uh, take away the physical space. But in the end, and you know, our our safe, safe streets advocates don't like this part, but you do need police enforcement at the end. I mean, you can avoid automated tickets with a paper fake license plate, and you right. do need some level of traffic stops to uh, deter the most egregious antisocial behavior. Right. And then, you know, in the tech world, you know, an issue we talk about a lot is last mile. Um, and, you know, what are the ways to use technology to arguably get, you know, goods and services and products to people more efficiently. So ideas ranging from delivery drones to autonomous cars, autonomous trucks, flying cars, uh, you know, even things like ride sharing, scooters, all of that are all the types of things that we VCs love to sort of fund and and talk about. Um, Where do you think technology offers some hope here? I think one one issue of technology is how the city approaches it in terms of physical space and regulation. So we know we made enormous mistakes with Uber, you know, going back a decade ago that we don't, you know, we don't have to relitigate them. But in the future, we can integrate many of these things, but we need to be taking physical space for a rational approach to them. So, for example, if we're going to do... uh, more cargo e-bike deliveries mm-hmm. where the stuff is unloaded from UPS and FedEx closer to the riversides and it comes into the core of the city on cargo bikes. That's great, but you need a dedicated lane for those vehicles so that the average pedestrian just doesn't see cargo bikes going every which way and on the sidewalks yeah. and everything else yeah. and saying this is just chaos. You know, same thing with the e-bikes, the mopeds, have a dedicated space for these vehicles, but then actually enforce the law so they're not just adding, you know, chaos and disorder to the streets. So is there a point where, and the Adams administration did issue some permits for autonomous vehicle testing the other day, is there a point where we can get to level five autonomous driving and have a lot less congestion simply because we've taken sort of the human element out of the mix? Uh, We've been saying we're going to get to level five for, you know, a decade now, and we haven't quite done it. Yeah, although Uh, I would argue a lot of that is because on the regulatory side, there's been so many roadblocks to sort of doing the kind of testing needed to get there, Um, not just here, but especially on the federal level. That's that's part of why. Right. I mean, Cuomo, I believe it was Cuomo who signed the law allowing autonomous testing of vehicles Mm -hmm probably 10 years ago now and it wasn't and that law was what set out you have to have a person in the vehicle yeah. 
So Adams has finally greenlit having those tests on New York City streets. I think that's fine. I mean, the way they've designed it with the person in the vehicle is probably the closest that they're they're going to get to having mm-hmm. a safe way to approach it. And we want we want the companies in charge of the vehicles to learn how the vehicles act in the New York City environment with pedestrians walking every which way, with yep. e-bikes going the wrong way, you know, everything else, the, con- the double parking, the congestion. So the only way for them to learn this environment is from, for them to be in this environment. I think just like the original generation of Uber and Lyft, this, this is good in giving people more options. It's bad if it just leads to a cheaper way for people to get around via single occupancy car and therefore you have more people getting away. Right. Via, like, for example, if I if I don't have to go pick up my kid from school, I can just send an autonomous car to pick up my kid. Am I adding more traffic than I otherwise would have? So right. in taking space away from the traffics and some rational way of pricing the traffic, you can deal with it. Uh, but the city has to be more ahead of that than behind it. And, you know, Adams is a sort of famous tech non-skeptic, you know, and everything from the robots patrolling the subways to the new uh, windshield boots on the cars. You know, maybe some of this makes sense, but maybe some of it doesn't. Right. And and so speaking of pricing it, you know, as you mentioned, congestion pricing is is slated to start in, what, about eight weeks now or something like that. how, what's your sense of how this is all going to play out, and do you think it will have proven to be a good idea or not? If it doesn't happen, the state will blame the lawsuits, and the transit advocates and congestion pricing advocates will blame the lawsuits. But it's really, it is on Hochul whether it happens or not, whether you agree with it or not. There are ways and were ways to approach the lawsuits to neutralize them. So, the state can do a deal with New Jersey. You give Phil Murphy $100 million a year out of the billion or so congestion pricing is raising for New Jersey Transit. It makes sense under the philosophy of congestion pricing. You are funding the parallel transit into Manhattan from New Jersey, and he needs the money. So that would be a way for Murphy to declare victory. The whole issue of should they have done a full environmental impact statement instead of the short assessment They could have avoided that by just doing the full assessment or full statement in the first place. They could have done it under the same time frame. So they are. I mean, this idea was originally proposed in what, like two thousand and yeah. I mean, you can go back. It was it was really originally proposed in the late nineteen sixties. So so there's been time to do it. Yeah. So there were ways for them to do deals with these opponents rather than using them as a foil. And do you think it's because they are secretly hoping that it? doesn't happen so there's no political fallout for them? Or do you think they just literally don't understand how to get stuff done? Uh, I think a little bit of both. I mean, leaving the MTA to its own devices to go through this process, you know, sometimes you can see why Cuomo was so paranoid about not letting the MTA do anything before he knew about it. I mean, that when they released the statement saying this would add, you know, 50 to 700 more trucks on the Cross Bronx Expressway without even giving a heads up to Richie Torres. I mean, sort of bad politicking. So I think yeah. some of it is thinking it's a bureaucratic process when it is really a political process. Um, but if she, if she actually pushes the button on it, you know, whether you're for it or against it, she will deserve commendation for doing, for doing something. something. Yeah, yeah, because it is... It's hard to do. I mean, the people will vote against it in right. legislation. And I think to her credit, you know, she's more action-oriented than I think I, people might have expected. So, you know, for example, when she, it was highly controversial, but um, when she stationed, you know, National Guard and, and New York State troops uh, on the subway, it's like, to me, it's like, all right, well, somebody's doing something. Like, I understand why the optics might not be good or whatever, but, like, ultimately, she's at least trying to do something. Yeah, she's proven pretty adept at the big dramatic uh, gesture with the National Guard and yeah. congestion pricing is also a big dramatic gesture. Let me, yeah. can I bring up yes. one more thing about getting stuff done? Um, just this morning, I think in the New Yorker, there was a big piece on Jessica Tisch uh, and sort of the Department of Sanitation's uh, war on trash. 
and I actually think the Adams administration, I'm not trying to write a write an ad for their next campaign, but they have done stuff on trash and you can see it very physically on the street now. You see restaurants, businesses using new car- cartons. Mm-hmm. I rode a bike through West Harlem. You see lots of um, on street, very clean and organized large tr- uh, trash receptacles. It seems like, you know, Jessica Tisch, the the administration has gotten stuff done when it comes to trash. But, but she's also saying, not the typical Adams appointee, right? This could she, be the she, answer. She is the anomaly. Well, this could be the answer to my question. And when then you were mentioning earlier um, uh, transportation and and announcing a bus a, a bike lane project, working on it for 